Hi, everybody. Jeff Wise back with you for another episode of Finding MA370. This is the show where we gather clues and we assess the evidence in order to solve the case. I'm not just here to talk about the case. I'm here to solve it. And we are getting closer. Okay, today I'm going to talk about new physical evidence that sheds light on the plane's fate. Two episodes ago, I told you about the Lepus Anatifra barnacles that I was able to collect uh, with the help of Josh and Arsheen at Two Winds uh, Stand Up Paddle Boarding in Zanzibar. Today, I have some quite revealing statistical analysis of that data. Uh, I think it's really exciting. Uh, I don't think I'm going too far uh, out on a limb to say that this work moves us significantly closer to an answer. And I'm going to tell you all about it right now. What I'm about to tell you is quite a bit at odds with what the widely accepted common sense view of the case is. Uh, so I thought I would tell it to you in a kind of a parable that I think illustrates a useful way of thinking about things. It goes like this, okay? A plane vanishes in the night, a cryptic clue appears, and when that clue is deciphered, it indicates that the plane flew into a remote patch of ocean the only hint of what happened to the plane is this cryptic clue. Until 15 months later, a piece of debris washes up on an island uh, on the other side of the ocean, 3,000 miles away. So, okay, investigators say we finally have confirmation. This is that piece of hard evidence we've been looking for. We know that the plane really did go in the ocean. Okay, here comes the twist, right? Imagine that the investigators find out that when the manufacturer of the airplane built this particular piece, they included a timing device that was built into it. And it was designed so that if the piece ever went into the ocean, it would start running a timer whenever from the moment that piece went in the water. Okay, it's an unlikely scenario, but just go with, bear with me here. So this timer has been running ever since it went into the ocean. Now, here's the sort of hypothetical. Would investigators look at the timer? I mean, of, uh, of course they would, right? That's kind of uh, rhetorical. They would look at the, at the thing. Now, they already know when this plane went in the water. So they, they know what the answer is going to be, right? They know that it's been 15 months since the plane presumably crashed in the ocean. It's been floating all that time. It should say 15 months, right? Okay. Now let's tweak it one extra bit. Let's add a, another layer of difficulty. What if the manufacturers designed the timer such that it was reading out in a kind of code, like a hexadecimal code or something? So it wasn't just reading out like a regular digital clock that you could just look at and understand what it was saying. To understand the numbers, investigators would have to go, you know, like dig into the engineering files and, and do a certain amount of work to figure it out. Okay. Now, so maybe the answer is a little bit different now because maybe the investigators would think, well, you know what? What's the point of all this? We already know when the plane disappeared. We know when it came ashore. There's nothing this timer can really tell us that we don't already know. So maybe it's really not worth the effort. Let's just let it go. Now, imagine that someone could say, you know, hey, guys, I'm just curious, you know, Maybe there's no reason to have any expectations, but you know, since we've got this mystery on our hands, we might as well look at everything, right? So, so he digs into the documentation, figures out the code, and he deciphers the timer's readout. And what he finds in this hypothetical scenario, this kind of parable, he finds that the, that the timer actually says three months. The timer says that this piece has been in the water for three months, not 15 months, but three months. What would we make of that? How could we explain that? So as part of this experiment, this thought experiment, I would like to ask you, the viewer, to contemplate that scenario for a second. How would you make sense of that scenario? Investigators know that the plane went into the ocean, or they think based on this cryptic data that it went in the ocean 15 months ago. Now they have a timer that says it's only three months. How would you you, viewer, explain that. I'd like you to take a second, maybe even hit pause on this video, think about it, maybe write a comment below here. 
telling me what you think would be an explanation that would make sense. Um, do that. Okay. I'm going to say, I'm going to assume you've unpaused it if you've even done this in the first place. Okay. Because the reason I bring up this sort of loopy parable is that it's not really much of a parable. It's kind of close to an actual description of what the situation is, except instead of a timer that was you know built by Boeing and installed inside the flap run, the timer is the population of Lepus anatifra barnacles, this creature that we've been talking about for so many episodes. It started growing on the flap run within the first week of it being in the water, as Lepus do. And if lepus barnacles grow at a steady rate, as they're believed to do, then the size of those barnacles should tell us how long the flat pond was in the ocean. But, you know, like the timer in the parable, when the flat pond came ashore, scientists didn't know how to read the timer. They didn't know how fast barnacles grow in that particular part of the ocean. All they had actually was a, like a handful of papers from like decades before that didn't even, weren't even about that particular stretch of ocean. So... What I've been doing, of course, is to try to decode that timer, gathering lepus from global drifters so that we can calibrate the growth rate and understand what those flapron uh, lepus are trying to tell us. It, at the very least, allows us to put an upper bound on how long that flapron could have been in the ocean. So in this case, we have global drifter buoy number 230 1816, which was deployed on August 6th, 2024, near the Maldives. It floated uh, in this way, on the, as you can see. I, I'd like to thank uh, Mark Duvall for making the animation using data from the Global Drifter program. That was extremely, extremely helpful. And you've been generous with your time, Mark. Thanks very much. So when it was retrieved by Josh and Arsheen this past June, it had been in the water for 10 months. Uh, I finally got around to measuring uh, the barnacles. It took me a while. Uh, I had other projects and this was, there were more than 700 of these little guys. So it took me a while, but I, I, uh, I put them on a graph. It looks like this. When I made this histogram, the distribution looked a bit like a bell curve. So I plotted it uh, on a normal distribution uh, on the data and it came out looking pretty good. Um, I have no reason to think that these barnacles should follow a normal distribution, but empirically uh, I, I, I think we can say that it works pretty well, especially up here uh, at the, the larger end, which is the part that gives us the most information about how long the object has been in the water because these big barnacles are the ones that presumably have been growing the longest. They were there the, the closest in time to the thing going in the water. So as you can see, there's one big outlier here. This is the 4.59 centimeter long barnacle. It was the king of the barnacles on this object. There's a, a bunch more that are a little bit smaller, but still uh, they're over four centimeters. And there's like a, a, a ton that are between three and four centimeters, even more between two and three, the average barnacle being 2.43 centimeters long. So let me say that historically, when researchers have been using LEPA size to gauge how long something has been floating, uh, there've been a handful of studies along these lines, they've tended to focus on how big the longest barnacle is. Yeah, and again, this makes sense because the biggest one is the oldest one. Um, and if size correlates with age, that should be the one that tells us how long the piece has been in the water. The problem is that lepus barnacles might disappear. Any individual, you know, that you might happen to point out could get eaten, it could die. The shells might fall apart after they've been collected, in which case you can't really measure them anymore. Any of these things... Uh, would make it impossible to include that particular individual in the total data set. And if you lose that one biggest shell, all of a sudden your object doesn't seem as old as it really is. Is there a way around this problem? Well, it seemed to me that if you take the totality of the population, that should tell you something itself about how long the object has been in the water. And it might be more robust because even if you lose the biggest barnacles, or the biggest few barnacles, the shape of the histogram will remain pretty much the same. And that could be really useful when you're trying to characterize a population of lepus uh, for the purposes of comparison. 
and trying to figure out how old something is basically or how long it's been in the water. So an example of what I'm talking about, let's look at, at the Lepus population found on the Flaperon, okay, which came ashore on La Réunion in July of 2025. According to a, a Lepus researcher who has had many dealings with the French investigators and who I've also been in contact with, according to this person, all of the shells have been disposed of, meaning they have been thrown out. This vital clue probably the most important physical clue to the fate of the plane was discarded, was thrown out, was ejected. It's no more. Finny. However, there were some photographs that were taken of various collections of these shells in, in bags and, and jars. And, and some of those images also included rulers. So I was able to do photogrammetry to determine the size of some of these shells. And it's a much smaller data set than what I was able to get from the drifter, um, but it is it is nonetheless, I think, significant. We also know from the port how long the longest barnacle was. So altogether, what we have at this point is um, a subset of shells from the Flapron that when you measure them, it looks like this. So this is a much smaller data set, but it does look similar. The shape of the histogram is similar. It, it also doesn't fit too badly with a bell curve. Uh, so if we compare these two bell curves, we, can, we get a kind of interesting result. So as you can see here, the drifter buoy barnacles shown here in blue are significantly larger than the flat rod barnacles. The average is 2.43 versus 2.12. But the differences gets really quite a bit larger when you look at the right hand tail of the curve. Now, I'm not a statistician. I didn't even really take status statistics in college, um, but I will. I think I can say this, which is that um, there's a measurement that's frequently associated with so-called normal distributions uh, that is called the standard deviation. It tells you how wide the curve is. And if we look at these standard deviations, we get an interesting comparison. For the Flapron, three standards away, three standard deviations away from the mean is 3.42 centimeters, which is not too far from the observed biggest barnacle, which is 3.5 centimeters. And at the, by the same token, the standard three, uh, three standard deviations from the mean from the for the drifter boy gives us 4.29 centimeters which is a bit less than the 4.59 centimeters, which uh, was measured uh, as the longest barnacle for the drifter. But, you know, I think it's broadly consistent. I think, I think this idea lends weight to the hypothesis that a population of lepus barnacles can be compared statistically to give a, you know, a really robust and I would say reliable indication of how long they've been growing on that particular object. In this case, the barnacles on the drifter boy are known to have been growing for 10 months. So it is reasonable to infer that the flapron, based on this evidence, was floating for considerably less than that, perhaps just the three months that I discussed in episode 38. So let's get back to the question I asked on top, which is how do we explain a timer that says that the piece was only in the water for three months when the plane had disappeared 15 months ago. And I think that the answer can only be that the flapron did not go into the water with the plane. And if that's the case, that means the plane did not go into the ocean either. Now I know that this runs counter to some very deeply held beliefs that the, about the plane that people have, a lot of people will struggle and squirm to avoid it. It's very easy. One thing I've learned in covering this case is that it's very easy for people to just ignore evidence that does not fit with their, the picture that's in their head. Um, but we need to grapple with it. And how? I, in the past, I have gotten many, many comments to the fact that, well, maybe the flapron was attached uh, to the wreck and it fell to the bottom of the ocean. And then, you know, maybe a year later, it floated to the surface. And that's why the barnacles are only three months old. There's a lot of problems with that. Um, maybe the biggest is that three months is just not enough time to float 3,000 miles. Um, an equally big problem is that anything that falls to the bottom of a three-mile deep ocean is going to be crushed. It's going to be crushed like a styrofoam cup. It's never going to float again. Um, another idea uh, that people have 
proposed is that, you know, maybe the flap ron was attached to something else that kind of held it out of the water for a year. And then it broke off and, and, and only then did it start to grow lepus. The problem is that the thing the flap ron is connected to is the wing. That's the only thing it's connected to. It's held on by a set of metal arms. Um, if it's been through the kind of impact that's so violent that it's ripped off the back third of its tail section, it's really not credible to imagine that those two metal arms would have stayed intact and then just spontaneously break a year later. I find that very far-fetched. There's one objection that I do think has merit and which I plan to investigate further. And that is whether the drifter buoy that we collected in Zanzibar is really truly representative of lepus populations in the Western Indian Ocean in general. Maybe sometimes they grow faster and sometimes they grow slower. We just don't know at this point. We have one data set. It confirms all of the other sort of partial clues that we've gathered in the past, but we don't have a corpus of multiple drifter boys or other kinds of sources of lepus populations that have all grown freely floating in the ocean that we can compare. So maybe it varies a lot. And it's not hard to imagine that. Things in nature often grow at different rates. Um, so to really nail down the reliability of lepus as a timing device, as a forensic tool, we need to collect more lepus populations, each of which has a known duration of immersion. And that is something that I'm continuing to work on. Um, I want to shout out to an excellent friend of the podcast, Rochelle Reynolds, who has been helping me really relentlessly for quite a long time now. Uh, try to keep an eye on the Drifter Boy uh, data uh, information that's constantly updated by the National Atmospheric and Oceanic Administration. Um, you know, Right now we are in the in the in the the throes of a government shutdown. So I don't know if that data will keep coming. Fortunately, for now, it's still good. Knock on wood, they'll keep coming. Um, as I speak, last time I checked, which was a few minutes ago, there is a buoy that is stuck on the reef at Aldabra, which is part of the Outer Islands chain of the Seychelles. There is a team of scientists on the island from the Seychelles Island Foundation. It's And they have been there for weeks. This thing has been there for weeks, but the weather has been relentlessly rough. It's too rough for them to go out and get it. They seem interested in helping out. Hopefully things will come down. They'll be able to grab it. That would be amazing. We were lucky with the Zanzibar Drifter. We have to be ready to be lucky again. You know, there's all these opportunities to get this data. It's just a matter of time, frankly. Um, so looking forward, Let's imagine that we do get two or three or four more data sets from the Drifter Boys. Let's, just, let's imagine that they all tell a consistent story, as I suspect they will, but who knows. The question that I'm asking is, at what point does the scientific community begin to accept that Lepus is a reliable timer of time of immersion? When do they accept that the evidence undermines the mainstream narrative about MH370, namely that the plane had to have gone in the water? Could the public consensus eventually come around to the idea that, yes, the evidence is solid and it tells us at long last what really happened to the missing plane? I'd love to hear your thoughts. This isn't just about gathering data, analyzing data, coming to conclusions. This is really about a collective process of forming meaning of forming a collective understanding. And I don't know if what I've just told you seems convincing or not. I, I don't know what work needs to be done. W one of the things I'm thinking about is publishing a scientific paper, maybe in, in, in cahoots with some marine biologists who have kind of professional standing in this regard. The, the, the data that I've collected has never been collected by anyone professional or amateur before. This is the only data we have that has been taken directly from buoys floating in the open ocean. So it's new. Um, I think it's exciting. I think it's real. I think it will stand up to scrutiny I, and I want it to be scrutinized. But anyway, tell me what you think. Leave your comments here uh, or visit the show page at findingmh370.com. By the way, of course, when you go there, you can sign up for a free newsletter that goes out with each episode. And if you really want to help the podcast, 
I, it would be really amazing if you would consider uh, going for a paid subscription. That would be not only a moral uplift, but it really helps me um, keep this thing going. But anyway, I appreciate your just being here and grokking this information with me. As always, this is Jeff Wise. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.